Thanks, Nico. We kind of answered the question already what happened <laughs> to the e-commerce hockey stick, but um, I will elaborate on it a little more and, uh, and also try to head over here so I can actually see these slides. So this is a hockey stick. This was e-commerce. Um, and what we saw in, uh, in 2020, as Nico said, was that tremendous growth rate. And that is really when we're talking about the hockey stick, that's what we mean is that 2020 growth rate level. Um, this was reflected in a whole bunch of different companies. And I picked three that were pretty evocative of the growth and the success of, of retail in the pandemic. Um, Grubhub, Wayfair, and Blue Apron, all sectors that we know were huge beneficiaries of, of the pandemic, and they had the exact same track that all of e-commerce did. Uh, now, what's happened since? So it's almost as if you took a mirror and you flipped it, you flipped that hockey stick, um, and what you saw is essentially growth rates that replicated where we were prior to the pandemic, and that is essentially um, you know, kind of what happened is that there was so much speculation that the growth that we saw in 2020 would continue forever. We heard all kinds of expressions like, we're going to see 10 years of growth in one year. Um, and really what we saw is like maybe two years of growth in, in a year. Um, so it was really this, um, this expression, which is that 2020 was essentially a sugar high for, for the entire category. Um, these numbers were replicated um, almost to a T for all of those companies that were big beneficiaries. Um, and if they were smart enough to have got more venture capital funding in like 2021 or 2020 or 2021, they were, they were, they were good. But if they kept thinking that this was gonna continue, which a lot of them mistakenly did, this is essentially what happened. And then, you know, kind of we're, I'll, I'll share with you some of the outcome for, for even other players in, um, in the, uh, the grocery delivery on demand, all of those sectors that were um, really the, the companies that did well in 2020. Now, um, looking at it from an aggregate level, uh, I thought I would just share with you some, some of the data here. Here's US data and some of the top European markets as well sort of uh, mapped against one another. And almost across the board, um, you saw a similar story. So look at the lines, not the, the bars. The lines, um, you know, kind of, and this is a forecast also that goes out a few years. So we're projecting that e-commerce um, into the, you know, kind of foreseeable future in the United States um, will probably just normalize back to where it was prior to the pandemic. In Europe, the story was a little bit different. It actually declined pretty substantially in 2021. Um, in large part because of interest rates, because of they're in a worse recession than um, than we are. Um, oil prices had, and energy prices had a much worse impact on on Europe than it did on the United States, and that's why you saw the numbers that you did. So their retail numbers. Um, were challenged, but their e-commerce numbers were challenged as well. And that's something that I don't think gets enough um, press in general is that, you know, kind of given where we are now in a global downturn, given where we are with respect to, to energy prices, the United States, I would say, has fared pretty well in, in, you know, kind of the face of all of this. And that's something that we don't acknowledge enough about. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, I think, political, um, sentiment that uh, we, we, we tend to want to ignore that. Now, overall, though, um, e-commerce is still a growing number. And it's a smaller and smaller. It, it is not as large of a percent as we thought it would be. But as you can see, it's more than a trillion dollars now in the United States. That's the dark green. And then the European numbers are the light green. I want to step back and, and look at what else is happening, um, because those are, that's sort of like the 2022-2023 state of, of e-commerce. But there are a lot of other things that are also happening that ha did happen through the pandemic that I don't think are going to make things particularly easy for the retail sector or e-commerce or urban centers. And let me walk you through that. Then we'll talk about some of the things that that I would suggest, I'm gonna throw them out there. We're gonna have all day today and tomorrow, and I'm curious to hear what everybody else's thoughts are on these because um, I don't know that there are gonna be easy answers to, to a lot of the challenges here. And the first is that we have seen 
um, some pretty severe closures of stores and moving of essentially the centers of gravity and economic influence from city centers out to the suburbs. So um, the number one reason, of course, Nico pointed this out, is that work from home issue. Just another way to frame that data is the percent of uh, essentially workers who are um, you know, kind of actually that office occupancy rate, which is just barely creeping back to over 50% of where it was. Um, but even so, we're, you know, kind of, if you look at this trend, it, it's gonna be a while before we get back to, to any type of normalization. Now, what does that mean for retail? Um, well, it's not really a particularly good story for retail because when we look, and this is placer.ai data, placer, by the way, has excellent free resources on um, traffic that they collect through cell phone signals. Um, and, and they basically um, mapped a number of urban areas and the percent of retail recovery in those different regions. And as you can see, when you look at almost any city in the United States, they are not at 100% of where they were in, uh, in 2019. Now, this is even more optimistic than the reality, because let's take a city like Chicago, which is at the top of this list here, and you dig deeper into specific neighborhoods, and the story is even more grim. So let's take a neighborhood like uh, the zip code 60611 in Chicago, which is where Miracle Mile is located. That's the water tower. That is Michigan Avenue. That is you know kind of the heart of some of the most expensive retail real estate in the country and you know, kind of where a bunch of flagship stores are located. 90% is the retail recovery for all of Metro Chicago for that zip code, we're at 59%. And uh, this, is, this is a huge, huge problem because this is also replicated um, almost in, in every city in the country. So this is Starbucks data, and this is a handful of their cities, and how their metro traffic is are the top set of lines. Um, the bottom set of lines are all of their downtown traffic numbers. So this is, this is a big problem for all of those cities where you have um, essentially office space without that, that mixed use, without the residential um, real estate without, you know, kind of, and, and, and tourism is, is another issue as well, which, you know, kind of is recovering, but is, is, continues to be a problem in cities like Las Vegas and Miami, which were heavily dependent on tourists for a long time. Um, and this has essentially led to the expression, the downtown downturn. Um, and what we, we mean by this are a couple of, of things. And this is, this is data on, um, and it's, it's not the, the you know, kind of, I, I don't have the 2022 numbers here for that, but this was a good study by, um, this, was, this was an excellent study by J.P. Morgan Chase on how um, businesses were shaking out and where, you know, kind of businesses were, were going. And as, and again, this is, you know, kind of similar to what Nico had said earlier, which is that those inner cities, those downtown um, establishments are where the biggest shakeout is happening, which is the red, the bottom line there. And where businesses are going instead are to those suburbs. So it's that shift away from, um, from the inner city to, uh, to, the, to the suburban areas. Now, the only good thing here is that you see that that red line seems to be somewhat recovering, um, but the truth is is that it's still, this is a growth number. So growth is still negative. It is, um, you know, kind of, an, and even if it goes to zero, we, all it, that says is that, you know, kind of, we're not declining ad additionally, all, you know, kind of, but we're, we are net net less than where we were prior to, to the pandemic. Now, the other somewhat good news is that um, when we're looking at other regions of the world, um, you, you look at Asia or Europe, um, particularly these, these dense cities where there is more mixed use real estate, their neighborhoods tend to look more like a Chelsea or a meatpacking district where um, people live and offices are. It's less like a downtown Dallas or Charlotte. Um, you know, kind of their recovery seems to be a little bit more 
more promising um, than, than in a lot of the urban centers in the United States. Um, and one other thing I just want to point out about this non-urban growth, just to kind of, you know, kind of further bring that point home, is when we do look at where is retail growing, because it's not in urban centers, it is often in rural areas or suburban areas. And a great data point to support that is the growth in the dollar channel. So this is on the left-hand side, just essentially the growth in the number of dollar stores. And just to illustrate what exactly that means is I took some data from Dollar General, and everything in the dark green clusters are essentially more urban-ish, or at least more heavy populated areas. Everything in the light green are essentially rural or suburban areas. As you can see, there are a lot of Dollar General stores in, in those regions that is that's essentially been their growth strategy. And, uh, and that's where, when you talk about, well, where is retail growing? That's absolutely where it is growing. The second big theme that happened through the pandemic that continues to um, be a significant part of, of what's happening in retail is the growth in in-store pickup. And in particular, how that's happening at the expense of delivery, which is, which is interesting um, because uh, there, are, there are a lot of, you know, kind of confounding numbers going in different directions, but let me just sort of walk you through what we see here. So first, last mile, um, as an investment vehicle in the retail industry has essentially been on fire. So um, retail and, and e-commerce has been a pretty big beneficiary of venture capital um, in the last, I would say, five to 10 years. And when we look at the biggest funded startups in the world that are in retail, here are the top 10, six of them are last mile related. So. It's been something that investors are super, super bullish on, and they're even more bullish on the performance of these companies in Asia than they are in the United States or even Europe. Um, however, what is interesting is that in spite of all of that keen interest in, you know, kind of last mile delivery that people were so excited about during the pandemic, we've also seen in-store pickup grow. And a large part of the reason that it grew is that um, well, companies introduced it. Companies have to figure out how to make their retail real estate more productive. Companies like Walmart and Target and Dick Sporting Goods and Staples and the list goes on. And so what we've seen is the click and collect numbers in the United States continue to grow. As a percent of e-commerce, it's about a double digit percent. Um, and a significant part of where click and collect is most prevalent, is, is you know, kind of heavily prevalent, I should say, is in grocery. And um, I work with IRI, which has a lot of panel and scanner data from lots of different stores around the country. And um, they break out grocery into a few different sectors. They broke it out into edible perishable, edible non-perishable, and non-perishable goods. And when we're looking at like essentially what is the core of grocery purchases, which are those edible perishable goods, Consumers actually would prefer to get those, just pick those up rather than have those delivered. Um, and it makes sense. Like, you know, I mean, if you're ordering ice cream or you're ordering chicken, um, you don't, raw chicken, you know, you certainly don't want it left out on your, your doorstep for, um, you know, hours at a time. You'd rather, you know, kind of make sure it's refrigerated and pick it up in, in person. Um, the other piece that is crucial is digital kitchens. Digital kitchens have all also grown. And digital kitchens are essentially those where you order ahead and you order entirely on an app. There's not really even um, a store-focused POS. This is an example um, of one that has, you know, Kava is like essentially almost like a, um, a Middle Eastern version of, of Chipotle. And um, you can't really see it here on the slide, but they're on their app. They actually encourage the pickup. They discourage the delivery by um, informing the shopper of the, th that higher fee. Now, as a result of all this, it is not surprising that we've seen a pretty substantial shakeout of some of the biggest funded startups. We've seen um, down you know, kind of downtrending in their valuations of companies like Instacart. You've seen companies like Instacart completely pivot from delivery to more of a, you know, kind of a business model that is more kind of B2B services and selling the technology to other grocers. Um, companies like GoPuff, which were the darlings of VC, um, really essentially had, had um, have, have croaked as a result of, of this shift from 
urban centers to suburban. It's really expensive to deliver to suburbia. So that's that's part of the problem as well. Now the hope was that technologies like micro fulfillment centers, which were heavily reliant on robotics, would make a difference. But the issue is that the build out for any robotic solution like this is like $10 million. So when you replicate that across different neighborhoods, you take the more expensive cost of real estate in cities, it becomes less viable. And you know, kind of when you saw that hockey stick going down, people may have been excited to make these investments in 2020. Well, they put them on hold um, following, you know, kind of 2020. Too. So what else is happening? We see inflation also being a big issue. Now, in spite of inflation, what I will point to is the fact that this seems to have had almost zero impact on consumer spend, because in the United States, retail spend is higher than ever. Now, you know, I always have people saying, well, if it's inflation adjusted, it would be lower, right? Well, that's what the red dot is, is that even if you adjusted for inflation, that number in 2023 is still higher than we were prior to the pandemic, and it's substantially higher. Not only is it substantially higher, it is higher in sectors like food away from home, which are highly discretionary spent. Now, I have a thesis that I think that, you know, because the labor market's so hot, there are a lot of people that are probably working two, three jobs because they can and trying to, you know, kind of collect everything that they can now. And, you know, kind of they're spending it in things like like eating out because they don't have time to cook. Um, but, uh, but that's, these are things that, you know, kind of we often tend to not hear as much about. Part of the negative sentiment is highly correlated to the negative news media stories. This is essentially data from University of Michigan and mapping exactly the percent of people that say that they are hearing the negative news stories and how their um, consumer sentiment is almost exactly one-to-one -one matched with that. So the more that you hear bad things, the more that you're going to think things are in the doldrums. And I also don't want to you know, kind of uh, eliminate the, you know, kind of the political bias that we have as well, um, you know, kind of when we're looking across the board for like the last couple of years, um, you know, depending on who's in office in the White House, that's going to absolutely impact whether or not you perceive things to be uh, positive or, or not. The last point here is about sustainability and the interest. And, and this is, of course, like the goal that we all have is to create more sustainable buildings and sustainable city centers. And, and the data shows that consumers seemingly are heading in that direction too. At Forrester, we have um, a framework that we created of basically a segmentation of consumers. And we tried to map out, okay, who doesn't care about the, the environment and who does? And what we have here is about 17% of US consumers are what we call active greens. They're the people who care the most about the economy, or sorry, about the environment. And they actually are willing to um, put their money where their mouth is and to spend more for those more sustainable products. I contrast that um, at the bottom, the 23% who are you know, completely the, the people who don't care and would rather just have the cheapest prices. It's a little bit different in Europe where they tend to have more of the active greens. And a lot of people are in that middle where if you make it easy, they'll buy green, but, you know, kind of if they had their druthers, they would rather just get the cheaper prices. So this is what we are, are battling with is, is, you know, kind of that sub 20% of people who are, you know, our friends with respect to the environment and everybody else who we have to still continue to persuade. Now, how do we persuade them? Often we have to do this um, with laws. And there are laws that are coming. There are laws that are um, incredibly compelling um, that 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 will eventually, if they're embraced in a big way, will have an impact. And there are things like extended producer responsibility laws as part of that. And what that means is that you essentially tax um, producers up front so that, you know, kind of when the product is at the end of its life cycle, it could be, an, and it's often with electronic goods, but we're also talking about this with respect to like fashion um, and apparel so that, you know, kind of when you're done with, you know, wearing your Primark shirt like once or twice, you know, you're not going to throw it into a landfill or you're going to think twice about it because it's going to cost you something. That's the idea is, you know, kind of how can we you recognize the afterlife and the cost of putting something into a landfill that shouldn't go into a landfill and either force that cost onto the consumer or the producer up front. South Africa's already put these in place. Europe is putting these in place. And then on a state-by-state -state basis, you have some places that are doing it, like, for instance, um, New, York, New York State. 
Um, and across the OECD, you know, the number of those laws that are proposed is going up. Um, you have some consumers recognizing the importance of just throwing things into landfills and wreck it, or the, I should say, the uh, the catastrophe that happens when we just throw things into landfills. And and they're 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 changing their behavior altogether. So the growth of organizations like the Buy Nothing movement um, has has really exploded through the last few years. And this is something that I expect will happen more, where these are people who just want to borrow things locally from their neighbors. And of course, technology and the internet and being able to post things on, you know, kind of your micro version of, of a Craigslist or a next door is where some of the, the power here comes from. Um, the ability to, you know, if you don't need a blender, you have an extra half an onion you're not planning on using. Like, you know, kind of how can you, um, you know, kind of make sure that there's less waste wherever possible. The other thing that we have started to see, which I think is also interesting from a sustainability and e-commerce standpoint, is taxation on delivery of packages. So um, in the state of Colorado, they've essentially done that, is to start taxing, not in a huge way, probably like a, a dime or so a package, um, but nonetheless, to put, pa to put taxes on delivery carriers um, who are, of course, you know, using our roads and using our roads probably more than, than they should. And, and often because they're heavy vehicles, you know, causing more wear and tear on the roads. And the state has, has essentially passed some of those negative externalities right onto the carrier. That's something I envision more. Um, some of the other bigger challenges with retail are related to entire sectors like gas stations and what happens to them, what happens to the fuel station, um, you know, kind of in the light of electric vehicles. This is data from Columbia University and different, you know, kind of different almost estimates to what's, what's going to happen to vehicle miles traveled. I just thought it was interesting that even the most conservative estimates by oil companies is that 30% um, of our vehicle miles traveled are going to happen on electric vehicles. And uh, that's probably optimistic. It's probably going to be significantly higher than that. So fuel stations have had a boon in the last year or so. Um, but, uh, but you, you know, kind of in the next 10 years, they really need to grapple with the reality of, of, of essentially um, a declining business. So there's good news and bad news here. The good news is that when I last came and talked, it was a lot about, you know, kind of the delivery of tomatoes and boxes to people's homes and blocking streets um, in, in major dense urban centers. That's less of an issue now because, as you saw from a lot of the data here, people are just not in the cities quite as much. Um, but we've created another problem here, which is that downtowns are essentially dead. And, you know, a lot of downtowns are becoming, you know, kind of deader. And uh, redevelopment is, isn't always an option. So these are my thoughts on what are some of the opportunities here. First is that to the degree that cities can encourage returning to work, either through programming, um, encourage it through um, better uh, improvements in safety. If you look like at a city like Chicago, which has had such a spike in violent crime, I mean, that's certainly not a driver of why you'd want to go back to the city to, to go work or work late ever. Um, so also thinking about like clustering on key days, if that helps to encourage retail to stay open. So, um, you know, kind of if there is a sense that, you know, kind of their, their efforts to encourage people to come in on Wednesday or Thursday and you can make sure that, that the surrounding businesses are, are kind of kept, um, you, you know, kind of in, in pace with that, that that's actually a win-win-win for um, the retail establishments, the office workers, and, and hopefully ultimately the city as well. Um, taxes and increasing fees. And we know that there's a lot of money that's being lost with respect to, to parking revenue going away. Um, you can try to increase things like parking. You can also, parking fees, you can also try to move some of those fees elsewhere. So if you, um, you know, kind of whether it's coming through e-commerce delivery package taxation or um, potentially even taxing some home workers. I mean, are there ways to, to look at, um, you know, kind of making up the revenue that cities may be losing otherwise? Um, you can try to redevelop what you can. You know, kind of everybody knows that the, there's, there's a shortage of, of, of housing, affordable housing, um, and the hope is, well, if you have all of this real, real estate, can't you just redevelop it? The challenge is that in most cities, um, you are talking about sub 10% 
of that office space that is actually convertible, and that's a that's a problem. So I do encourage, where possible, absolutely redevelop and and you know kind of change change the real estate out. It's just not. Um, always the most feasible thing to do. Um, so where does that leave us? So you can try to also um, allow commercial tenants to sublease. We're hearing a lot of that. So um, as Nico had mentioned, you, there's um, maybe like a whatever 18% vacancy rate. That doesn't mean that you know kind of there's not more empty real estate. And we certainly, I mean, I certainly see that in, in my headquarters and my home office in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's it's for the most part it's empty. And you know what are some things they can do is they can sublease and and maybe um, have really really attractive terms for maybe some startups or other companies so that at least there's there's some um, revenue that's coming back to uh, to the tenants, the core tenants. You can encourage new types of tenants. So um, where I live in Charlotte, North Carolina, there are all sorts of tenants that are, there's charter schools and churches and call centers and whatnot that are constantly looking for space. And if that means, you know, potentially using some of this office space to you know, kind of move into, um, so be it, because that's can can often be, you know, probably more cost effective than than developing, you know, kind of new space that that may be, you know, kind of otherwise inconvenient. Um, other things um, to just consider is that worst case, so we've seen a little bit of this this arc with shopping malls. And shopping malls, what we saw is like these C malls over the years that were just in terrible shape. And they would just linger, 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 and they would have like a handful of tenants. And um, worst case scenario is that you'll end up with downtowns that you know kind of are are hanging on, uh, hanging on by a thread. Best case scenario, you'll actually have the um, the, the traffic come back, you'll actually have tenants come back, you'll actually have more of a forced work from home, or the economy grows to the point that there are enough businesses that are being established that do look for real estate that could ultimately, um, you know, kind of be housed in, in some of that empty real estate. So, you know, kind of T TBD, I think that we're all, you know, kind of wondering what, what ultimately happens in, in this type of environment. Um, and the last bit is that, you know, kind of most of our cities probably stand to encourage more of a startup culture. And I would actually say encourage a startup culture in areas that we need startups in. And, um, and even force them to, to be located downtown. I mean, I, I, you know, kind of, I was at a startup years ago where we were forced to be in our downtown because that was the terms of getting, getting some of that startup capital. One of the areas that I just want to leave you with is that we are incredibly underfunded in education. And the number of education and ed tech startups out there, it's like embarrassingly low. And when we look at who is actually funding ed tech startups, it's the Chinese. It is not Americans. It is not American entrepreneurs or venture capitalists. And I contrast that with retail, where the number on the left-hand side is the amount of money that has gone to retail startups, often last mile delivery startups, which I would argue is not the best use of our resources, whereas we haven't spent nearly as much in, in sectors like education. So, you know, just to kind of consider that, throw that out there, and maybe that's like the future of, of the, uh, the economy and new businesses and how, how we regenerate some of these urban centers. So um, with that, I'm gonna wrap up. This is my email information. If you do wanna connect with me on social media, like I guess sometimes I'm on Twitter these days, and LinkedIn, um, feel free to do so. So thank you so much.